Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. If you're a visitor and you don't have a Bible, there should be one in in your pew. Um, Please use that, and if you'd like, you may take that. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who had the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For what hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And Father, thank you for your word. And again, we just acknowledge you as our God. And, and we also acknowledge our dependency upon you to make your book come alive to us. And for your children, may they know the illuminating work of the Spirit. May we be pulled away from the, the horizontal and the trappings of this world to focus on the glory to be revealed. And Lord, for those who have yet to uh, comprehend their need for the Savior, uh, may the the gospel be so clear and in childlike faith, repentance, would you draw them to him. So Father, thank you again for preserving your word. Thank you for the long line of witnesses that have gone before us, even given their lives so we can have an open Bible. And Lord, for the persecuted church around the world that doesn't have the privilege that we have today, uh, we pray for them that they would be strengthened And Lord, for us who have yet to encounter that level of persecution, may we never take for granted what you granted us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, We've returned to uh, this portion of Scripture in Romans chapter 8, 18 through 25. And this is the chapter on assurance. This is the one that... um, if you're struggling for assurance of salvation, if you're just quite not sure where you're at, this is your chapter. This is where uh, you'll need to go uh, to find yourself assured in your relationship with the Lord Jesus. As we come into uh, 18 through 25, there's a future look. Paul is taking the, the Romans and us, and he's wanting us to look ahead. But if you notice in verse 18 where we're at, he also would give us the sense of time, and this is the only time uh, in this chapter, in this uh, reference, that he would give uh, a reference to the now. He would say, in this present time, uh, that is the time from Christ's resurrection till his return, this present time, and then he would draw our attention away from the present time to the word, to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so what he is revealing in verse 18, and this is so crucial to understanding, is this is the Christian life. Uh, The verse 18 is that we live in this present time in a world of sorrow, in a world of suffering. God has ordained that that is the the way it is. Uh, We should not think it to be any otherwise because he has said that we are going to suffer not only the result of the fall as human beings, but we are going to suffer as Christians for uh, the cause of Christ, his truth, his gospel, as well as conformity to his love, to his uh, image. Uh, But we now have, though, is the back end of that. And it's important we understand what Paul is doing. He says, don't compare. The sufferings of this life are not even worthy of being discussed to what lies ahead. So he's drawing our attention now to the glory that is to be revealed. Now, when you think about this glory that is revealed to you and to us, it's important we understand that this isn't just the place of heaven. It's not just about, I'm escaping this world and I'm going to heaven. I have done a lot of funerals in my, in my years of, of being a pastor, and, and some of those have been extremely sad because they were unbelievers. And you'll find that unbelieving people will even grasp for a hope. They've gone to a better place, uh, or, or they've gone to where there's no more suffering. But there's no gospel there. But that's the innate crying of the soul for hope when they have no hope. And so when we look at this, the glory that is revealed to us, even as Christians, we cannot keep that in such a narrow way as just heaven. It certainly is part of that, but there's more to this, which we hope to see. 
Now on this desire for, for the glory to be revealed, this is part of what's given to us at new birth. Is we find it throughout the, uh, the scriptures that there's a hunger. And the Paul, the, Paul would use language such as yearning for or an eager longing. I want this. So when you're born again, God places within you this yearning for the not yet. There's this yearning for uh, the glory to be revealed to us. And so just to reduce it to heaven fails to understand just what the gospel has done. It creates within us this understanding that we are pilgrims in a, in a land that is not our home. That we are exiles traveling through. And so you have this yearning within you like the psalmist. Where David would cry out of the wilderness of Judea. He would say, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David is not crying out that he wants God to do something. He's crying out of the earnestness of his relationship that he wants God. He wants to experience the reality of the glory that awaits him. And he would go on and say, so have I looked in the sanctuary beholding your power and your glory. He remembers what it was like to worship with God's people in the holy city. He remembers what it's like when God's glory filled the temple. He understood, you know, that there was something in his relationship with God that yearned within him for more and more of the reality of his person. We see in Psalm 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are your words to my, ta to my taste. And when you look at your own life as a Christian, uh, it is a good exercise to ask yourself the question, do I yearn for this glory that is to be revealed? Is there the same heartbeat that David has? Is there the same heartbeat that Paul would say the creation, all of creation has? He would say this inward yearning, this eager longing. Do you find yourself in the fight of fights against sin, against your own fleshly desires, against a world that is against God? The name of our Lord is blasphemy. Do you find yourself yearning deep inside for the glory yet to be revealed? This is a very real aspect of being a Christian. And there's no, there, there's, uh, no reason why this shouldn't be our experience. Charles Spurgeon, he would uh, tell us that the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ is by way of experience. Turn with you to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 and 7. In this week and next week, we are going to spend time, Lord willing, looking at, Paul would say in verse 18, the glory that is to be revealed to us. What is that glory? What is it that awaits the, the, the Christian? What is it that beats within the, the breast of the Christian that I, I want this, I, I'm yearning for this? We're, we're, we're going to look at the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ today. Next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the glory of God in the children of God, our yearning for glorification, and then we're going to look at the glory of heaven. But today, just the, one, just the one aspect of this glory that we are to know as a foretaste now, and remember this, the Spirit of God has been given to us as a first fruits as a guarantee of what lies ahead. So in a very real way, every true Christian has this yearning inside to be delivered from this body of death so that we would partake of the glory that is to be revealed. And it's not escapism. It's the heartbeat to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want you to think for a minute what it means to be a Christian. What do we tell the world? What we tell the world is absolutely radical. It is absolutely radical. Is that we tell the world that we know the one true living God, that he has walked among humanity, that I have personally encountered this risen Christ. He has changed my life, and daily I walk in a very real fellowship with this God who's coming back. Amen. That's what we tell the world. And so the question would be, is that what we tell each other? Are we living the reality of the glory that is revealed in the now? There has to be a very real foretaste of that. A very real communion with the triune God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5. 
Would not the Apostle Paul have a foretaste of all of this? When he would say, for me to live is Christ, and I am in such earnest anxiety to be with him. I would rather go right now and be with him than be here. And what Paul is talking about in, in uh, Romans 8.18, stay on 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 7, that's our primary text, is that in 18 when he says, the sufferings in this life are not compared with the glory that is revealed to us. What he is referring to is, is the appearance of Jesus Christ. He's, he's referring to the second coming. He's referring to when Christ, when, when the heavenlies open up and every eye shall see him. Now think for a minute how the sufferings of this life compared with that great scene, surely they're not to be compared. Now we all go through suffering. We all go through a lot of that. And sometimes we think it's forever. In our ABF uh, class this morning, R.C. Sproul was talking about uh, this woman that was uh, dying of cancer, and she was in pain for 10 years. Then we looked at the woman with the blood issue for 12 years, and the pain was incredible. But even that compared to what is going to happen, and, and think about the radical nature of what it means to be a Christian, not only to the world, but do you realize that one, you're one breath away, I am one breath away from face to face with the God-man. One breath right now. And, and the question I have to ask myself, and I ask you, because Paul says the glory that is revealed, that is the uh, apocalypse, that is the, the, the appearance of Christ. And do you know in the New Testament, every writer emphasizes the coming of Christ. Every writer uh, writes with a passion to know him at his coming. In fact, all of life is oriented around his coming. And so I think it behooves us as Christians to ask us, ourselves, is my life oriented around the sudden appearing of Jesus Christ? Because you don't know that at 1115, you're not going to be there. You don't know at the end of this day that you may appear before him. And I find that the more that I think about his coming, and the more that I think about the glory that has been is going to be revealed to me, the more it frees me up from all that, that troubles me in this life. Whether it be the political arena, whether it be just the, uh, the cares of this world, it's all those things that Jesus says that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness because all these things will be provided for you. Now, when he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that isn't just righteous conduct. Who is our righteousness? It is the Lord Jesus. He is our righteousness. So we are to seek him as the priority and not just to serve him, but to adore him. Because when you see him, what's going to happen? There's going to be adoration like we can't even describe. And so the whole of the New Testament points to this revelation of him coming back. And Paul, Paul would say to these Romans that this is where assurance lies. In the midst of your suffering now, don't focus on the pain, focus on what lies ahead at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. And here's the first aspect of that glory that is going to be revealed. It is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, we're driven back to the Genesis account, has shown in our hearts to what? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now notice what he says, that Paul, shine, Paul says God shines in the heart to give the light of the knowledge. That's why knowledge is important. We have an intellectual faith. True faith begins with knowledge. And then it, then it embraces with assent to the knowledge and then it cast itself upon trust of the knowledge. That's the three ingredients of true faith. It's knowledge, assent, and abandonment, so to speak. Back to what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon says that the glory of the person of Christ, the glory of God in the person of Christ, is by way of experience. He would go through and he would preach a sermon, three, two, two or three sermons on this text. And he would go through and he would say that, that there's different aspects of how God reveals 
the glory of himself in the person of Christ. And in one of the ways, he says, it's by experience. Don't be afraid of experience. But make sure that it's God who defines the experience and not you. And Spurgeon would go on and say, have you not heard of Christ's doctrine in your soul? If so, you felt it to be divine. For your heart perceived its moral and spiritual glory. And you concluded that God is in it in truth. Beloved, have you not felt the Lord's presence? Have you not had and been admitted to intimate communion with him? Then I know that a profound awe has crept over you, which has made you fall at his feet, and in the lowliest reverence of your spirit, you have owned him to be the Lord and God. Friends, that's not just for Revelation 4 and 5. There is to be very real experiences with the living God, the triune God, that we encounter some measure of glory in our experience. And the question would be, have you? Have you been caught up in times of prayer where you were speechless because the presence of the Lord met you? And Spurgeon is not going off the, of a tangent here. Is that he's trying to say it, tell us that there is a very real sense that this glory to be revealed in the person of Jesus Christ is for us now as the first fruits, us now as those who have truly encountered Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul never lost sight of Damascus Road. How do I know that? Because the longer he went on with the Lord, the more that he saw his depravity and the greatness of, of glory, the greatness of his grace. And that should be our, our growth too. The more that we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus and knowledge and grace and the grace of seeing his glory in the scripture, in prayer, that we really know the presence of the Lord. The more we see how much we're not like him, the more that that gulf and we're thinking, how could he save such a wretch like me? And then you go to praise because he says, I do. Now, Paul would say in verse 7 of the 2 Corinthians 4 passage, that it's in jars of clay we receive this. And it would drive us back to the lowliness of the creation in, in Romans chapter 8. That creation groans itself. All of creation groans for this. This deliverance. Because the curse has caused this burdensome upon all of creation. And when the glory of Jesus Christ is revealed, then he's going to make all things new. He's going to make all things well. As I mentioned, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, he drives us back to the Genesis account where God said, let there be light, and there was light, Genesis 1, 3. And now we move into the, the New Testament, and we find that Jesus is the, is the light, and God says, now let there be the light of the knowledge of me in the face of my son into your heart. And in both counts, you know what we have? We have the power of God's word. We have the power of God's word that spoke into creation, the physical world. And then we have the power of God's word in the gospel, speaking light into dead sinners. Speaking life into dead sinners. That's why you have to be in a place that's committed to the scriptures, committed to law and gospel. That's why you have to be into the totality where the whole counsel of God, because from Genesis to Revelation, it's all the unfolding of the redemptive history of God in Christ Jesus, showing us how God has taken the light of the gospel and shined it into the hearts of sinners so that they are awakened to the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And in a very real way, what was the true of the apostles will be true of us. John writes, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. You may be sitting here and say, well, Jim, I don't know, I don't know anything about this glory. I, I can't remember the last time I've had the presence of the Lord as defined in the New Testament. The beauty of the Lord shining upon my soul where I was left speechless. I was overwhelmed by the blazing beauty of Jesus Christ revealed to me in the scripture. Don't be discouraged think, well, I must not be a Christian. You're not going to live on that Mount of Transfiguration experience your whole life. You're not. That's what heaven's going to be. But there should be encounters with Christ. There should be very real encounters with the triune God. There should be times in our prayer closets we have nothing to say. We're just in awe of the presence of God. 
And I think it's one of the missing elements in the church today. Because if you look at the definition of glory, you know what it means? It means brilliance. It means beauty. It means majesty. It also means weightiness, gravity. And that is encompassed in the fear of God. And what is the missing elements in much of, of what I believe is modern day Christendom is there's no fear of God in our worship. There's no fear of God to realize in who we are dealing with. He is not like us. And that he reveals himself in his scripture and you should have very real encounters and I hope that you pray like David. Lord, I want my God. I want to know you. I want to encounter the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is what happened to Stephen, the first martyr. Acts chapter 7, 54, I'll read it to you. And when they heard these things, they were enraged. Stephen just decimates these people with his speech. He gives them the history of God's working with the people of old. And he says, and they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. The beatific vision, if you want to say. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then he would say something that is not possible by any human being in the strength of themselves. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. But let's remember that Stephen didn't end that way. He started his speech with the glory of God. In verse 2, and Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. And then he says this interesting statement. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Why didn't you say the God of Abraham appeared to Abraham? He said the God of glory. He begins and ends his speech with references to God dwelling with his, pe- his people. And in the times of old, in the tabernacle, in the temple, what we have is God's glory ascending on his people. And he did so, and this recognizes where the presence of God is, there is the glory of God. And then in the New Testament, what do we have? John says, and we beheld his glory. And they go on the Mount of Transfiguration, and what do they see? They see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If anything is accomplished, and I pray the Lord does this for you, as I pray he does this for me, that it creates a hunger in us that at all costs, we need to know this God. That we need to behold the beauty and the the majesty of the person of Jesus Christ through the scripture. And we find ourselves in our prayer closet, not just giving a form prayer of God bless or God do this, but that we are coming to to God like David. Oh God, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. I pray that your prayer, I pray this my prayer, is that I don't want this this cultural or, or behavioral Christianity. The Bible teaches we are to encounter this living God in a very real experience as defined by the scriptures. And tell me, how could it not be? How can you not encounter the Savior who forgives you all of your sin, who reveals his love to you, and not have an affectionate encounter that radically changes you? How can there there be a living engagement with Jesus Christ and not create a hunger within us? Is it, I want more. I want to know you more. And you just take it and look at this through your Bible. Look at all the descriptions of a Christian full of joy, inexpressible, and full of glory. What about the Christian who rejoices in all sufferings? What about the Christian who does all things without complaining? What about the Christian who gives thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God? Those things cannot be true unless we're encountering the one who empowers us to do those. It has to be. And friends, I don't want you to think I'm going off on some rail here. You say, what happened to him? He's all about, no, that's not what I'm saying. 
What I'm trying to say is that we need to read our Bibles and we need to ask the question, does this define my Christianity? Does this define, am I able to get beaten to a pulp, go back to the people that uh, are my people and pray and say, Lord, thank you that we have been counted worthy to suffer for your name. And please don't prevent that. Give us boldness to keep on saying it. Friends, there's something missing in contemporary Christianity when we're more prone to talk about what we do or we're more prone to even complain about the government or we're more prone to talk about the difficulties of life and we're not raptured with the magnificent person of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is saying. There is going to be a glory revealed to you And if you don't know what that is, and you put the scale in verse 18 of Romans, he says, you put the scale of suffering on one side. He says, you put the glory revealed on the other side. And if you rightly understand the glory, then this is like a feather. It doesn't even matter. I'm not dismissing suffering. But if we don't know anything of the glory, and not just the knowledge of heaven, or the knowledge of Christ, if if that's all we know... And we don't know nothing about the heart comfort and the encounters with the God who says, neither do I condemn you. If we don't know nothing about that, do you know what the scale is going to be? The suffering wins out every time. And how do you know suffering wins out every time? Because we are a complaining lot. We complained a lot. I found myself complaining about humidity. You say, well, you know, the weather. No, you know what? Any, to- any form of complaining is rebellion against the sovereignty of God. But if you don't have the glory revealed, and revealed means to make known, that means we, make, we know some of it now with, with the stirring inside for more later. If we don't have that on this side of the scale, then suffering's going to win out every time. And here's the scary part about that. Because if we don't understand the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and encountering him. And by the way, you know how we can tell if we're pursuing that? It's how we pray. It's how we pray. Evaluate your prayers with the prayers of the Apostle Paul. Look at his prison epistle prayers. Father of glory, I pray that you might give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Father, I pray that out of the riches of your, of your glory, that you may strengthen them in their inner being, that Christ may dwell by faith, that they might know the height, depth, width, and the breadth of the love of God. Have you prayed those prayers recently? Nothing about the temporal, nothing about anything except I want to know him, and I want to be filled with his love. Those prayers are for us to pray. And if you, don't know how, if you don't know what to pray, just don't, as John Bunyan would say, just don't fill the air with lip labor. Don't do that. If you don't know what to pray, run to Ephesians chapter 1. Run to Ephesians chapter 3 and say, Lord, I don't know what to pray, but Paul's praying this for believers, and I'm a believer. And if this is what I'm supposed to have, if this is the glory of your son revealing you to me, I want this. And pray those prayers. Stephen saw the glory. Stephen saw the glory, and in some measure, like I said, we are to see that as well. And this theme of glory, as I mentioned, it is throughout the New Testament. See what Peter says about it. Peter would say he had the Mount of Transfiguration experience. He says, but rejoice in so much as you share Christ's sufferings now, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Same thing as Paul says in Romans 8, 18. Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of, your li- of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Is God not omnipresent? Absolutely. The psalmist says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. I have advantage to point here, and I'm not, I'm not beating on sheep today. I don't beat sheep. I beat on one sheep. I beat on this one. But this is what I want to say. I look around here. And I know that, I know there's, there's a lot of joy missing in your face. I'm not, I'm not passing judgment on you. But I talk to Christians. Christians talk to me. Is your life marked by joy? 
Is your mark by what the psalmist says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. Joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one of the first fruits. And I would argue that on all the efforts we make by evangelism, that the greatest, the greatest impact we're going to have on people in our homes, people in our communities, the greatest impact, and I'm not saying being silent, we have to all be sharing the gospel. The greatest impact you're going to have on people is your life affirming the gospel, and that is by a fruit of the Spirit life. That is an irresistible force that will work on people. If, imagine every relationship you had that you're manifesting love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. You're going to stick out as a radiant light in a very dark place. And where does that come from? Beholding the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is revealed through the disciplines of the prayer and disciplines of the word. Now I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. That was all what, by way of introduction. You know, I, when you read through church history, and I hope you do, and re- read through periods of, of awakenings, these weren't fanatics. These were theologically sound men that God used. They were sound expository preachers. And you will find so many times they talk about the experience that they've had with the living God. Last week I I gave you examples of Jonathan Edwards and David Brainerd. There's so much more. You could go through so much more and look, look through history and you will see that God has revealed himself to his people. And when God reveals himself to his people, we sense his presence. You know what happens? Transformation. Transformation. A transformation that not only changes our lives, but it changes the church's lives, and it changes the culture. It really will. We're not going to change the culture just because uh, um, there's a shift in administration in the fall. We're not going to change the culture just because uh, there may be a shift in, uh, in, in Congress. That's not going to change the culture. You're just going to change the culture is a revived church that takes seriously to be salt and light in the culture because they've been transformed by Jesus Christ. That's what's going to change the culture. And it can't be the church that's all hunkered down in a bunker that just it's all about us and no one else. It has to be a church that has encountered the living God and the glory to be revealed that causes us to be on mission with a passion and a love because we're encountering him who is passionate and and loves sinners. It always flows from who we are in Jesus Christ. Is that my ministry will only be as effective as my closeness to Jesus Christ. That's always the case. And it's the case with you too in your homes, as the head of your homes, as ministry leaders, it won't be, it will be how close we are to Christ that makes the difference in all that we do. Training is important. We're committed to that. Knowledge is important. We're committed to that. But it's also and primarily, as McShane was said, it's not great talents that God uses the most. It's the great likeness to Jesus he uses the most. And that likeness is only found when you're encountering the glory of God in Christ Jesus. And I want us to look at the Revelation, uh, next 10 minutes or so. Um, I want us to look at Revelation chapter uh, 12. No, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. And what I want us to do is I want us to look at John's vision. And I want us to see Christ as he is. What we have here is not a physical description of Christ. Don't make it to be so. It's not a portrait. John is, not, is, is, is writing symbolic, symbolically, and he's actually capturing Old Testament, Testament symbols and placing it upon the Lord Jesus. Joe Beakey has said this, quote, John offers us a word picture here, not an artist's impression. Some people have tried to paint his, this description of Christ, and the results have been absurd. You cannot and should not try to produce a picture of Christ in any way, end quote. Think about it. What human artist could actually paint a picture of Jesus? This is not that. But what we do get from this is a description of his glorious identity. And I want us to work our way through 12 to 18, and I want to look at six marks of his identity. Because this is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the glory that we're supposed to see. 
You might say, well, Jim, why are we looking at this? Because as I mentioned, I believe the church needs an overhaul of its Christology. I think the church is lacking an accurate picture of who Jesus is. If all you see Jesus as as a Savior, and all you see him as as a shepherd, and all you see him in his, in his humanity riding a donkey, you have an incomplete Jesus. And what happens is if you don't have a proper Jesus, you will go one extreme to another. You will see Jesus all wrath as a God who's ready to pounce on you, and then you're going to be in bondage, and you're not going to enjoy the Christian life. Or you'll go on the other side, and you'll see that God is all love and no wrath, and then you'll live a life that's so loose that you don't even resemble a Christian. And so one of the, the, the things, and what I believe is true, is the church needs to recover a proper Christology. We need to see Jesus for who he is. We need, if God is indeed promoted the glory of himself in the person of Jesus Christ in the gospel and is as he is now, then that's the Jesus we have to deal with. And if we're not div dealing with a biblical Jesus, you know what's going to happen? We're going to paint a wrong Jesus, which means no Jesus, which means no Savior, which means no Lord, which means no glory to be revealed. Let's read this. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair, hairs of him were head, you know, his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I felt his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Friends, if we're seeing the right Jesus, then it will show up in our lives. And the area that it will show up the most, as I mentioned, is in our prayer lives. It won't be like us going to a prayer meeting and reading the New York Times to God. It won't be like re giving God an assessment of what's happening in the world. Now, I understand that we struggle with prayer. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is hard. But nevertheless, if we get a hold of who he is, that's what shapes our prayers. Because then we know who we're approaching. And we'll do it not in this, in this form, routine way that we got to make sure we, 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 we start it this way and we always end it this way. And all between filling in with all our petitions or all the, the ails that we have, we need to understand who we're dealing with. And who we're dealing with is in the Revelation 1, 12 through 18. And it's the right view of Jesus that will write the church and will write the Christian life. As I mentioned, Jesus is not, we're not looking at Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem. We're not looking at the suffering servant. We're looking at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Michael Horton in his book, Christless Christianity, the alternative gospel of the American church, he says, Jesus has been dressed up as a corporate CEO, a life coach, a cultural warrior, a political revolutionary, a philosopher, a co-pilot, a co-sufferer, a moral example, and a partner in fulfilling our personal and social dreams. But in all these ways, are we reducing the central character in the drama of redemption to a prop for our own play? Revelation 1, 12 through 13. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw a golden lampstand. And here's an important understanding of this. And in the midst of the lampstands, the lampstands represent churches. And notice what John would say about the head of the church. He's in his church. He's in the midst of his church. Are you aware of that today? Are you aware of that right now? That the head of the church walks among his lampstands. 
that he has promised to occupy the place of the praises of his people. Now, how would we know if we're aware of that? It's not necessarily how you feel. It's the awareness of who he is. That will include experience sometimes. There's been times I've seen some of you just crying your head out, crying your eyes out, because God has come and met you in a, in a very real way in a service. You know what my fear is, even standing here, is I'll come and I'll be like Jacob. The Lord was in this place and I knew it not. And, and I hope that causes some, some, some trembling with you too. Because if you're here right now and it's 20 minutes till 12 and you're already into Monday or Wednesday or Thursday, the Lord is in this place and you don't know it. There's no way that you're living far ahead if the Lord is among us. And I understand the battle distractions. I understand the battle that we fight in this. But friends, if the glory of God is being revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and we're properly expounding his word to point to him, then the Lord is among us. It's not only expository preaching that's required in the church, it's also expository listening. You gotta be a prepared listener. And that means you gotta fight the discipline of anything that would seek to take your thoughts and move it far away from this place. But we find the Lord is among us and that's an encouragement because he's here, but it's also a warning is don't miss him if he is here. And one of the other parts about this, which, which was scary, it is scary, is if you read Ezekiel, you get the first part of the, uh, the Old Testament book, Ezekiel, you know what it, it's about? It's about the, Lord, the glory of the Lord departing the temple. And they were going through all of the rituals, but there was no God. I think, oh Lord, don't let that be us. Don't let us come and go through the rituals of being a church, sing these great songs, listen to sound preaching, Soak in all the, the fellowship, but yet we're not aware of the glory of the Lord. We're not aware that he is occupying the place of his people. Let's look at six descriptions. The first one is in uh, verse 12 through 13. The first, John would give us the, the identity or the description of Christ's identity as the son of man. Christ as the son of man. Now, what does this reveal? Now, it's quick to jump off and say, well, that, that, that is his humanity. And that's true. It is humanity, but it's more. This is a revelation of his deity and his humanity. When he says here that like the son of man, Jesus would use that term to describe himself 81 times in the Gospels. That was his favorite title for himself. But it actually comes from Daniel's prophecy, Daniel's vision of Daniel 7. And in Daniel chapter 7, we read this, verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So Daniel's painting two, two figures, two individuals. There's the son of man and there's the ancient of days. Now notice how he describes the son of man. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. He is teaching us and showing us that the Son of Man is God. It is the deity that is being exposed to us in Daniel. Now, John, that's a, that's, by the way, that's a messianic description of Jesus. But in John, it's very interesting, is that John would describe the Son of Man, but actually he's describing the Ancient of Days, which shows the oneness of those two. Daniel was separating them. John brings them together to show us that there's a oneness between the Son and the Father, the triune God, who is one. And here is the glory of the God-man to us. I need Jesus to be the Ancient of Days. I need him to be the Son of Man in all the power of being God. But I also need him in his humanity. Like we saw this morning in REBF, the humanity of Christ that dealt with, with Jairus and his daughter, that dealt with a woman with a blood issue, that was never too busy to, to, to minister to the hurting. I need Jesus to... Right now, I need him being the God I can pray to, but I also need him to understand my frailties and my weaknesses. I need him to be the God-man, and I need him to be the Son of Man, 
who can look at me and says, I know your weaknesses. In every way, I was tempted like you, yet without sin. That's the God. And that prevents us from having this imbalance. Read B.B. B. B. Warfield's paper on the, the, uh, the emotions of our Lord. He has a wonderful description and a balance between the God-man, between his deity and his humanity. And so as we strive to fear him as the God-man, we also see his approachability. And that's what prevents us from levity. It prevents us from a lightness in coming into the presence of the living God. We tremble like the woman caught in adultery. We tremble because we're before the God we've offended, but we also walk away like she did, forgiven and cleansed, because the God-man in his humanity, he was able to die and be our Savior. The second thing, look also in verse 12 through 13. Here's a second picture we have of Jesus. Not only as the God-man, his deity is humanity, but we see him as the great high priest and the ruling king. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. John's vision would include his clothing. And what is he identifying as? As a priest, as a king. This is the garb of a priest, a high priest and a king. And one thing I think that you will discover as you encounter Christ more and more, as you encounter the glory of God in the person of Christ, is that you will see him and he'll begin to blossom more and more beyond just Savior. Is as you grow in, your, in the grace and knowledge of him and you see how far away you are from him and the humility that, that, that grips you because of your depravity and of his goodness and his grace, do you know what you'll lean on more of him? You'll lean upon his advocacy. You'll lean upon him as the high priest. That office of high priest will become so precious to you because you know that how often does he intercede for you? Always. There's very few things that are more encouraging to have someone tell you I'm praying for you. I got a brother who doesn't go to this church that I consider a mentor. Every Sunday morning, I get a lengthy text of him saying he's praying for me. And it is just a warmth to my soul. How much more the high priest Jesus is praying for us does that make you hunger to want to know more of him? Not to just ask him for things. Not for him to bless your ministry or bless you. But, but I want to know you. You're such a wonderful savior who now is my high priest. I want to know you. I want to see your glory. I want to see what's going to be revealed now in the measure I can have as a human being. Then we go down. We go down to verse 14. We see the third description, not only as the God-man, the ancient of days and the son of man, and not only as the great high priest and ruling king, we see him as, as God Almighty himself. Verse 14, the, the hairs of his head were white. I don't read that and think that's, that ha, it's not certainly an indication of, of age. It's not white hairs. That's what we're talking about, obviously. This is the same reference back to the ancient of days. Daniel 7, 9, I looked and the thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair in his head like pure wool. So John is again emphasizing the deity, but now the eternal God as Jesus. You don't have a wimpy Jesus. And some of the artists in the different generations that have tried to paint Christ, they paint him like, like he's such a weak person. He's not. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the roaring lion, the real roaring lion, not the devil, the one who is almighty God, who is able, and frankly, don't fret what's happening in our world today, it's under control. Almighty God, the God-man, the high priest, he is orchestrating every single thing. And just because we don't understand it doesn't mean we can't trust him. Now look at verse 14 and 15. Here's a fourth description of Christ. The Christ that we are to behold in his glory. And which we will literally someday, by now by faith. 14 and 15, his eyes were like a flame of fire. That is the indication of judgment, piercing judgment, his omniscience. His feet were like burnished bronze. That is, that is, that is power, strength. His voice is like the roar of many waters. 
what do we have now? Paul's describing him as the righteous authoritarian judge. And this authoritarian position and character of the Lord Jesus is also found in Daniel chapter 10, verse 6. His eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. We're beholding the glory of the Lord Jesus as the all-knowing, all-powerful judge. And friends, you can talk in a group of people out in the world today, and you can talk about Jesus as long as you include him as a way to truth or another option. But when you start declaring the absolute authoritative nature of Jesus Christ as the ancient of days, as the one who is from all eternity has existed, when you start making claims that that is who he is and there is none other, watch how the crowd either dissipates or they attack you. And yet that's who we come to. And I love the voice when he says here that John says his voice was like the roar of many waters. Remember where he's writing this revelation. On the island of Patmos, the rocky coast. When I was stationed overseas, when I was stationed in Gaeta, Italy, on the six feet flagship, we went up and down that, that coastline constantly. And I remember in that little fishing town, I wasn't a Christian, but we had a rocky coastland, and I would go over on the beach and go down by the side where, where it was all rock cliff, and I would sit there and just listen to the wash, the crashing of the waves. And it was loud, it was deafening almost. And I was set to just be mesmerized by watching the ocean come in and crashing into those rocks. The authority of Jesus Christ is to mesmerize his children. And he comes with the voice of many waters. Has the authority of his word so gripped you as you've encountered his authority that you wouldn't even consider playing with sin? You wouldn't even consider toying with sin. If you're encountering the glory of Christ and he's revealing himself in his authority, you would look at the temptation to sin and you would say, how in the world could I possibly do what he died for? His authority demands that I don't even play with sin. But if we don't see him in his absolute authority, if we don't see him as the judge, and we don't see him as the high priest, if you don't see the glory to be revealed, then you're going to fall to temptation. You're going to fall to temptation a lot. We've got to hurry. Number five, look at verse 16. Here's a fifth uh, truth of beholding the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He not only is the, is the son of man, his deity, humanity, he's not only the great high priest identifying with us in a ruling king, he not only is the almighty God, the, uh, the righteous authoritarian judge, he's also the protector of, the, of his church, and that by his word. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. You're immediately reminded that the sword is the sword of the Lord. It is his word. And we'll find that also, we won't look at it, but in Revelation 19, he comes with a sword. And the symbol is that of power and of protection. The right hand, the right hand is the, the side where there is that protection. And when we look at the Lord Jesus, we don't have to fear that his church is going to be overcome by the gates of hell. He has already said it's not going to happen. But it should warn us that doesn't mean that every local lampstand is going to stand. That if we compromise and if we don't recognize his glory and we're not shaped into that, there's no guarantee the local churches will continue. The churches in Revelation are gone. And the church at Ephesus, it wasn't long. And so look around Rhode Island. There's churches that are, that are art, art places. There's churches that are, that are turned into housing. And the final thing, the final thing, is we want to see the Lord Jesus in the power of his beauty. Or I should say the glory of his brilliant beauty. Look at verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Try to stare at the sun. Can't do it. But even though you can't, it's beautiful. And he also would build on this purity and this beauty by the image of snow. He would mention snow in Revelation 1.14. That his, he is pure like snow. 
Psalm 51, 7, David says that I might be whiter than snow. Isaiah 1, 18 says that she'll be as white as snow. I found that most of the uh, references uh, in the Bible with snow, it's always good. I kind of like that. You know, winter's my favorite season. I love snow. I love it. I love it for a lot of reasons, but one is that there's rarely a time that I don't see a, fall, a new fall in snow with no tracks in it, and it's beautiful, and it doesn't remind me that he has washed me whiter than snow. Creation sings loud through snow, and he uses snow as an example of purity. He uses the, the beauty of Christ like the sun shining. So let me ask you, have, have you encountered that Christ? Have you been reading your Bible and you just go through the motions of reading your Bible, but you've not had the glory appear to your soul? You've not seen the blazing beauty of Christ revealed in the scripture? You've not seen the purity? You've not seen the high priestly office of him? You've not been lost in a holy wonder of who he is where you could not, you were sad because you had to close your Bible and you had to quit praying because demands were upon you? Have you had those? Or is it just a duty that you go through, you just whip it off, and then you go about your day? I'll close with a quote from Thomas Brooks. Brooks said, Christ, Christian, one smile of Christ, one glimpse of Christ, one good word from Christ, one look of love from Christ in the days of trouble and darkness will more revive and refresh the soul than all your former service and experiences. Christ is the crown of crowns, the glory of glories, the heavens of heavens, and the most sparkling diamond in the ring of glory. And that's not just knowledge. That's the glory revealed. Father, may we have a, a glimpse of this that would so transform us and that we would be that force in the world because we've seen the king in all of his beauty. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.